Declining engagement in civil discourse and civic life presents fundamental challenges to democratic societies worldwide, creating a dangerous wave of polarization. SNF's approach to encouraging civil discourse and civic engagement is to help create opportunities to people to opt in, opening conversations on topics of critical importance and making them accessible to a broad range of audiences. In 2016, the Oxford Dictionaries selected post-truth as its word of the year, inspired in part by the election of Donald Trump in the United States, the Brexit uh, election that had just taken place, but also roots that go much deeper than that and branches that developed after the 2016 elections. It's a concern or an issue that is also global with Brazil and um, fake news post-truth. There are also, however, a number of critics and doubters Russia, India, Germany, South, South Africa, and elsewhere addressing issues that fall under the general rubric of misinformation. This moment is really that different than what we've had in the past. We have some of those on the panel today, which will make it very interesting. We have here an interdisciplinary panel of experts, a media strategist, filmmaker, and storyteller, Nusrat Durrani, a journalist, educator, and academic administrator, Nick Lemon, and a historian of science, Stephen Chapin. What we don't have, as you can see, is gender diversity, again, on this panel, and I wanted to say a word about that. I, from what I know about the foundation and the work that it does, and the leadership of the foundation, I have no doubt that some of the um, gender mixes on panels was absolutely not intentional. Um, but what I've learned um, from the last panel in particular, or the panel before that, is I think that's important not only because of issues of representation and issues of equity and justice, but also for issues of having the greatest, sometimes uh, not being intentional is not enough. Sometimes we have to be intentional. 
uh, especially on issues such as this. So, uh, and because I firmly believe that diversity adds to the quality of discussion and the range of voices that, that are heard. And so to the extent that this is not a diverse panel, at least at that level, uh, means that it will be diminished somewhat. But I hope will still be interesting. And I'd ask the audience, when you send questions, to not only send questions, um, but also comments or thoughts that might add to the range of viewpoints on the topics that were going to be discussed. The last thing I wanted to say is that I have experience with um, the value of true diversity because I was fortunate enough to be a faction that is um, uh, diverse in a variety of ways, but on the issue of gender, at least when I was there, the leadership was a member at Barnard College for uh, the mid -19, from the mid-1980s through the end of the 2000s. And I can tell you always at least 50% women. The faculty was 50% women. Uh, the tenured faculty was 50% women. Full professors, associate professors, assistant professors at each level were 50% women. It completely changed the dynamic of discussions on campus. And so it's a, a model, I think, of what diversity can add to excellence. Uh, so I just wanted to make that last point. But now to the topic at hand. Uh, on a variety of topics related to the issue of truth, um, accountability, uh, post-truth, and hopefully generate an interesting discussion. Uh, the format that I'm going to use is to simply put out some general questions to the panelists. Uh, with the panelists, I might do some follow-up when it seems appropriate, and then intersperse that with the, uh, any questions that come from the audience. And I just noticed that I do not have the iPad that gives those questions, so hopefully that can be brought out. Thank you. Okay. All right, well, let me start with the first question, which is really a definitional one. So what do we mean, especially since we're coming from different disciplines and backgrounds, what do we mean by post-truth and even related terms such as fake news to post-truth? So I will simply open that up. We can start, if you'd like, Nizrat, with you to talk about that a little bit. Sure. Um, and just to echo what you said earlier, Michael, I just also want to... Itself, that is, what is the problem that we're, that we're trying to address uh, and that has emerged from this notion or concept. Let's say that here we are, four middle-aged men, and I speak, I think, on behalf of the panel. Um, uh, um, and I think certainly four middle-aged men by themselves are not qualified to speak uh, about truth um, or credibility or anything at all without having more diversity on the panel. So having said that, I think the problem is that now in this day and age, as somebody who comes from a media background, but also as a citizen of the world, uh, we live in an age where it's possible to construct an entire alternative reality from lies, from half truths and it leads to really dangerous impressions. Um, for me, as somebody who is um, an immigrant to the future and a collusion of misinf misinformation, and I think the danger of that is that you could be creating mythologies um, that no in the United States, I've lived in the U.S. for about 25 years. Um, I think the moment this became very clear to me that we live in a post-truth world, it might have existed before, but to me it became evident when uh, right after 9-11, the President of the United States um, blatantly lied to the country about why and who attacked the towers and uh, in turn attacked a country that actually might have been evil or not, we don't know, but um, that had nothing really to do with those particular attacks. And the fact that there wasn't uh, really um, a concerted, comprehensive counter-programming and opposition to that, uh, to me, I think that meant we really are firm. About Iraq at this point, yes. not, not the Afghanistan? Or Correct. Both, okay. I mean, the whole thing was one big part of like a big, great big lie that was told to the American people and the world. Um, and present day examples of this kind of thing are, and I'm speaking only about the USA, but I think this is happening really in a day and age where you can create a hallucination, if you will, um, and people are just going to go along with that. Muslims are all terrorists. People are hungry and desperate and storming our borders trying to break in. 
uh, just the other day, the rest of the world, because we are, ironically, the leader of the free world in this regard these days. Uh, all Mexicans are rapists. Having an interview with Jake Tapper, and he said that the USA has the cleanest air in the world. Uh, patently untrue. And just bullshit. Uh, and, the, you know, and Jake Tapper is actually refuting him, but he's going on saying this. Um, so we live in an age where basically you can construct and when the President of the United States, and not to bring up the T word, and I know we're all dreading bringing him into this conversation, but, you know, if you are actually struck whatever alternative reality you want uh, with, the, with proper collusion from, you know, your constituents, and, uh, you know, we can all live in this bus states, go on and on and on for hours, um, talk about stuff that is completely untrue and, you're, untrue, and you're sitting in Idaho listening to this likely to believe him, right? And that's what is the beginning of the creation of an alternative reality that a lot of people in the United States and the rest of the world are living in. And I think it's truly dangerous. Well, I guess I want to disagree pretty forcefully with you, Nusrat, because I think this is nothing new. Um, that's, that's where I want to disagree. Um, I didn't say it was new. I'm just saying that for me, for, as a recent immigrant to the United States, it became patently true um, th that we are firmly in the post-truth era in the U.S. Right. But during because of that particular incident. Uh, that assumes there was a, but let's establish a few things. Um, so, you know, since I'm a journalist and a former journalism school dean, my the truth era. So. Um, that's what I wanted to talk about. I, I think this is a really, really interesting and difficult topic, which makes it a good topic for this discussion. Since the 2016 election with invitations to conferences and panels on fake news, post-truth, etc. Embedded in those, it seems to me, are three assumptions. Um, one, that there is such a thing as the truth and, and that it can be determined and agreed on. I think that's really, really questionable um, because a lot of politics is about preferences, not facts. Um, we can get back into that, but, but keep in your mind the question of if we want to be in a truth era, whom do we appoint to decide what's true and what's not true? Um, that's really important. Or do we trust the New York Times editors to put Jean Carroll's story on the front page and declare it to be news? Evidently not. So things, many examples like that. That's question number one. Question number two is once we have, if we can determine the truth, then how do we, what do we do about untruth? That is, basically you can't control fake news unless you cut back on the principle of free speech and or, or regulate speech or something like that. These are ideas that Europeans tend to be more comfortable with, Americans less comfortable. But again, that's an underlying question we have to talk about is are we willing to... The third issue is um, it's assumed, it's embedded in this conversation that if we lived in a truth atmosphere to essentially censor or forbid untruth from being disseminated through the media or even by politicians. That one's really hard to enforce. Truth or fake news atmosphere that the public would come to the correct political conclusions and it would affect voting behavior. That really runs against a rich literature on voting behavior over the years, which is that people just don't express their political preferences based primarily on receiving information. So that's another conclusion to worry about. One last little thing to start, um, just by way of getting back to what I was saying at first. We're about to hit the centennial of Walter Lippmann's book, Public Opinion. Then he thought, we're in a whole new situation. We're in a complex world with new problems that need to be resolved by expertise, not sentiment or interest. Uh, we have these new mass media that can use propaganda and, and spread just about everything. It's a great book. I don't really agree with it, but just about everything people are worried about now 
is in that book published in 19 Nation. We have unscrupulous leaders who led us to an unnecessary war. So there's nothing new here. Um, it's a recurring problem. In the beginning of that book, he has this long quote from the story of the cave in the Republic, which is perhaps the first appearance of fake news. And of course, the solution to the problem there was a, a confidence that the guardians could determine the truth and make policy on that basis, and B, that you just simply wouldn't have democracy. So, so that, would, that would be the solution. Think about, do you want that to be the solution? Lippmann himself became increasingly skeptical about democracy over the years for sort of platonic reasons, but I don't think most of us in, in the audience would be comfortable with that. So, so again, it's, it's, this is one of the most interesting and important problems there is. Um, if we understand it as that and not as a new phenomenon having to do with Brexit, Donald Trump, et cetera, or the internet for that matter. Well, uh, one of the more potentially interesting things that academics do, and I'm a purebred academic, not have no practical outcomes, uh, is also one of the most annoying. So I, I propose to start by being annoying and the annoying thing is to ask whether we've characterized the, not just the problem correctly, but the terms of the problem. So let me go on to suggest that if it's said we're living in a post-truth era, or a post-fact era, or even a anti-science era, I want to suggest ways in which, if that's not wrong, it's at least missing the target. So point number one, uh, Truth is not a vernacular term. There are certain scenes, and this may be one of them, in which people focus on the status of truth and the problems and the stability with truth. For example, in courtrooms, you swear that what you're about to say is the truth and the whole truth, an interesting category. Uh, you may also talk about truth in scenes of skepticism, like were you working late at the office last night? Were you, yes, it's true, I really was. Uh, and of course, truth is, a, is a, a focused subject of conversation in philosophy classrooms and especially in epistemology uh, uh, classrooms. And then on response to what the situation is. So let's take in the case of someone who's interested in science uh, areas where there seems to be a real problem with the authority of statements about the case. So we have notoriously climate change, we have our holiday is some less coherent and less neon glow surrounded notion like the case. Wife is a real category, but as it were, it's something going on holiday, to paraphrase Wittgenstein. Now, what's going on in this movement? And I suppose we should include uh, evolution by natural selection, a more lo long standing. Uh, now, if we think about those categories, we think about what's not in those categories of instability or dispute or conflict over the case. And we have almost the whole of science and many other areas of technical expertise. So that we have, for example, no notable controversy about the nucleotide structure of DNA, about the laws of motion or the laws of thermodynamics, uh, or indeed, although there may be exceptions to this, twice two equals four. So if we have a problem with the stability and authority of statements about the case, we have to understand that that, that problem is not global, but local and, and patchy. And that sounds like an academic exercise in pedanticism. I really hope it isn't, because if we characterize the problem correctly, I think we might think better, I hope we might think better about what a uh, When we talk about uh, climate change, we talk about vaccines, and we talk about even evolution by natural selection, where evolution uh, is. So that what we're looking at, I think, is twofold, and I'll just say a few more words and um, hand over, that if it conflicted with any man's right of dominion or interest, there would be disputes over that, but there isn't. Secondly, when we're talking about matters of concern, number one, 
Uh, Thomas Hobbes once said in the middle of the 17th century about the Pythagorean theorem that if it conflicted with any man's right of dominion or interest, there would be disputes over that, but there isn't. Secondly, when we look at things, and again this may be disputable, like climate change or the efficacy or danger of vaccines, or even evolution by natural selection, we're talking not about textbook science, but we're talking about open science, as Bruno Latour once said, science in action. Science in action is typically the area of science which is a matter of concern, but it's also a matter which is not closed, or not closed in the stable way the textbook science is. So the observation which annoys many people about the instability of scientific authority about climate change is the idea that there are many voices. There are indeed many people speaking about what is the case about climate change and its causes. What is the case about vaccines and its risks and dangers? So there are problems. One way we have further to go, but one way of talking about the nature uh, of the problem is to talk about the problem of identifying who or what institutions speak about the case in these areas. This is not a problem of the laws of thermodynamics or twice two equals four. And I think that, that gives us a way of going on and talking about what the problem is such that we might think about a, a solution to it. So, so I, I, I get the point that's being made, especially by Nick and by Stephen, that, um, that the, the issues of misinformation, the issues of um, uh, what is the truth, uh, and issues of support for the larger methodology of science and findings of science, even if there are individual cases, but I think it's really important from my own research and point of view uh, not to fall too far in that direction. I get the argument that falling in the direction of everything is different now can be problematic. And that's changed in a couple of ways, both the uh, advances of digital technologies and social networks, the globalization of the information environment. It's hard to argue, I, I think, against the fact that the information environment that we live in now has changed quite dramatically. That the uh, decline in both the authority of and the ability financially to do the job of more traditional journalism, I think those, that changes the, the political, social, and economic environment in which the kinds of issues that are always debated um, uh, are play out. Uh, it's also the case that we do, in the United States, have a president who has um, uh, lied more and misrepresented facts more than any other president in history, according to historians and members of the press who have tried to document this. And it's also the case that in cases like Brexit, uh, votes were made without substantial information and misinformation flowed through that. It is the case that this new technology allows for uh, the, uh, the, the entry of misinformation from other countries, um, as well as for more what used to be fringe groups to have more of a soapbox. And so, in my view, um, uh, it's, it's as important not to downplay what is dramatically different, in both, I will argue, good and bad ways, as it is not to overstate those differences. Well, but yeah. I want to ask you a question yeah. then, because the public state owned and controlled, uh, or two, as in the US, it would be very heavily regulated. So that's what we had, and that's why news. And, and the solution I'm painting with a broad brush was take two choices. One, either it would be somewhere. So, you know, when, when broadcast uh, was, television radio was created, there was a tremendous fear about the paradise of media regulation. Most people my generation would say, oh no, it's horrible, because the discourse is very narrowly channelized. Uh, when television was deregulated by Reagan, most people on the left cheered uh, because they thought it would unleash a lot of uh, pent-up left energy, and it did, but it also unleashed a lot of pent-up right energy. And then when the table was set for the internet, Room, we didn't have very much fake news. When the internet was created, I mean, I'm old enough to remember this, many of you won't be, if you... A, a couple of things about that, but then I want to bring uh, some other folks into this. Um, number one, 
what you've described, I think, is quite accurate, generally. Privilege free speech above everything. Anybody could say and publish anything. Anybody could receive anything. It sounded like paradise. So my question to you is, is it time to regulate the internet the way we used to regulate broadcast? So, um, and broadcast. What it shows is the tension between different things that we value, I think, in any democratic society. One is um, the idea that there would be um, a useful, usable information that is trustworthy, that citizens have, uh, and, uh, and that um, that information would be shared across a wide range of the, of the, of the public. The old environment uh, did the second. Uh, it often did the first. But when it got it wrong, the narrowness of, that, uh, of those people who had the soapbox was such that we all got it wrong. And when the, the, the few outlets that spoke to the larger public decided that an issue was not a public issue, the voices of those people who cared about that issue, of that segment of the population, often went on, mostly the television and radio stations, the major newspapers, because newspapers were already in decline. Um, when that happened, uh, uh, unheard. That was the downside of that model. The model of the, of, the, uh, of the multiple sources of information, first through cable and then through the internet, uh, some professional, some not professional, some ideological, some trying to be straight down the middle. Uh, the, what that did is, just as you described, was it opened up the event about how power resides in this new digital environment that we live in, but it also uh, kind of moved us back into a libertarian state in which it, it, it decentralized power in a way that's uh, very similar to the, um, to the keynote address we heard, really the opposite information that you just read. And so the issue of regulation should be on the table, but I will uh, com uh, completely acknowledge that I have no idea what kind of regulation because it runs the risk of silencing voices that should be heard. And so it's a dilemma that I do not know what to trust and what not to trust. It put much more burden on citizens to try to figure that out. And in many cases, you couldn't figure that out because you were one click of a mouse away from exactly the opposite information that you just read. And so the issue of regulation should be on the table, but I will completely acknowledge that I have no idea what kind of regulation because it runs the risk of silencing voices that should be heard. And so it's a dilemma that I do not have an answer to, but I think some form of regulation needs to be part of that. Uh, Stephen, looks like you want to get in on this and then... Uh... Yeah, um, it's, there is a, a, um, a category sometimes called, in my line of work, the deficit model. If the problem is, as some people think, it is public ignorance of science or public misunderstanding of science, I think this applies to all sorts of expert uh, knowledge then the problem is how to pour from the full bottle of expertise into the presumably empty bottle of, of the laity, of the, of the un, unwashed, uh, so that there is too little science in that bottle of the laity. I think the problem is the opposite. I think there isn't a problem of too little science, but too much. Now, what do I mean by that? What I mean is that especially in these areas of open science, of science in the making, of, 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 uh, of, of science dealing with matters of concern, and th this does bear upon new technology, there are more and more voices claiming to speak in the name of science. Now at one time, and in a model of science that said science was essentially aristocratic, that was a very bad thing because the ability to speak in the name of science and provide a set of uh, process of rigorous training and credentialed institutions, and then you were entitled to speak, followed a picture of science as essentially democratic and the, the model of a democratic open society along the lines of Karl Popper, in which the nature of science was to take every expression of a point of view or skepticism seriously to drop everything and entertain it. What we've got now aided through the internet is a, a, a plethora of voices, a surfeit of voices speaking in the name of science. So what we're asking the public to do is an extremely hard thing to do, is to sort out which are authentic and which are not. Now, no notion of the scientific method is going to enable the laity to do it, or even enable me 
to do this sort of thing. There are people speaking at the Institution of Creation Science in Santee in California who have PhDs from research universities. Other people speak in, uh, in the name of, of the Flat Earth. Uh, Wakefield, who published in The Lancet this notorious paper about the dangers uh, of vaccines and causing autism, had all the credentials, and his work was published in The Lancet, later retracted. Yeah. So what we are, in fact, asking the people to do with this surfeit of voices speaking in the name of science, science has become a great prize. And that means that more and more people, enabled by more and more powerful technology, are speaking the name of it. So the problem is really a very intractable problem. Which of them are authentic? Uh, did you want to get up? No, I'm, I'm fine. I want to add one other thing. You know, if we can distinguish between real news and fake news, um, in the US, acutely, a little less so in the rest of the world, but still it's there, there's a real crisis with real news, which is the economic model that I believe there is such a thing with all its flaws. It, it's generally done by you know, people who do it for a living, who work in institutions, and that world has been economically devastated by the internet. Um, most of my friends who aren't journalists don't completely get error and it's still going down. I, I can't think of another field, including coal mining, where that's true. So actually, I think that's a pretty fixable problem because if we as a society come together and provide other support mechanisms with the extent of this, my field is one where the headcount has been reduced by probably over 50%, enhance the production of real news. Example would be this magnificent hall where we're sitting. You know, opera started as a business, and then it lost some of its oomph as a business, but people recognized that it had tremendous social value. So, you know, people like city governments and the Stavros Niarchos Foundation stepped in and said, um, we're going to build an opera house and expect it to put on great productions and fill the hall. But what you don't expect sitting here is, okay, from now on, not only is there going to be a great opera house, but people are not going to listen to Europop anymore. Okay? That's the hard problem. So I think we can fix the real news deficit with great effort, and it will be imperfect. But what to do about getting people to believe the enhanced supply of real news and ignore To educate people at the level of complexity of the issues that are being, you know, science is one area, but other issues are equally complex. This oversupply of fake news, that's a hard problem. So that, and that ties to one of the questions we received from the folks in the audience, which is, uh, specifically, uh, uh, regulating the internet is not the right approach. How about educating the people better? But that cuts directly against your issue. Is, if, is it possible? Even though one of the potential answers to the questions that we we've, we're, ta we're dealing with? No, I don't think it is. I don't think Obama knew more science than Donald Trump. The difference is that Obama trusted the people that well, we thinking, want Obama I, th I think the trust. question is, is thinking about the audience, the, cons the consumers, of both news and other forms of information that are out there. The average citizen who's trying to make a decision as to who they support and where they stand on an issue. Um, is there a way, because I, I know there are multiple approaches that are being tried for this, in which you, we can educate citizens at least to the point of knowing how to distinguish information they can trust from information that they can't trust? I, That's, I think, can I question. jump in on I yeah. think that is absolutely um, a necessity to be honest, because I think that, I mean, with all of these technologies that now exist where you can propagate a lie and mis misinformation very quickly and very effectively, I do think that audiences need to be more empowered and potentially trained to detect bullshit from the truth. I, I don't know how successful we can be in doing this, but I do think that there needs to exist some kind of methodology to train our audiences to actually parse pure lies from, you know, from truth. But I also want to go back to something Nick was saying about the lack of investment in news, which I think is a real issue in an um, election campaign. We had news channels uh, for the first time covering entire rallies 
many of those rallies can be important point that you raised. I do think, Nick, that there is another problem, though, is what constitutes news coverage. I mean, during the 2006 lies and misinformation that when reported on a news channel could easily be misconstrued as endorsement of bullshit. And I think that we need to be, as broadcasters and news, news outlets, much, much more vigilant in the kind of thing that we consider newsworthy. I think that's a very important thing as well, because, you know, people are used to expecting facts from news channels, not just a reportage of rhetoric. Uh, on the issue of education, I also want to add as an example that I know that Italy, which has faced some of the same issues that we've been talking about, and actually has a history of uh, uh, issues of the, um, uh, of the nature of information in uh, they have introduced into their educational system media literacy and, and whether that and, will work and, or not is an open question. And in the U.S. that's all... At least in the, in the, in the world of politics because of ownership issues and uh, Berlusconi's uh, being both a politician and a media... Uh, um, in a lot of undergraduate colleges and so on. We haven't proved that it has the desired result, but, but it definitely is a course that now exists and is widely taught. So one of the issues um, that uh, I think is important in all of this is also the credibility of, of, of news outlets. I think trust for so many of the issues that are public issues, whether it's complex science issues or whether it's issues of politics or simply what's going on in the world, um, it, uh, because of the complex information environment, it's often hard to know which source to need needs to be earned, but I also think that many times uh, the mainstream media has developed or had developed in the 20th century a model of presenting the news that was devoid of context and that um, simply was not as interesting to readers uh, and uh, its rust. And um, uh, one of the reasons for that, I think, is because many times the mainstream media has let the public down, so there's trust, I think. And I wonder, Nasrat, if you could talk a little bit, at, not necessarily in the area of news, but more generally in the area of truth-seeking, mm -hmm. um, how storytelling fits into all of this. Well, I mean, I think that we all probably remember uh, the time where pure news on broadcast and cable um, went from being news to entertainment. And I think it was during the Iraq, first Iraq war and then followed by, by any other war we've had where we were actually watching news like entertainment. It was the first time we saw countries being bombed uh, in our living room while we had, you know, ate dinner. And I think news and, as entertainment is one of the most horrific things that could have happened in the United States. Um, I'm not asking you, answering your question directly, but I do want to bring something else into the conversation which has, by the way, no scientific basis at all. It's pure conjecture, and uh, still I will say this. I think one of the reasons why we are in such a post-truth era in the United States, and potentially in other countries, is because in the United States, the two reasons. One is we have um, a really appalling lack of self-awareness and self-analysis. We not hold up uh, anymore. And I think that one of the reasons why we're in this time is that because we cannot really handle it. Um, also, we have a, a, a real, we've been getting away with a lot of stuff for a long time. So this notion of American exceptionalism, that you know, America is a leader of the free world, um, that America is a leader in this or that, some of these truths. We're no longer the leader uh, in, what is leadership? How do you actually measure global leadership? How does America treat, treat its minorities? How do we treat our, the different races we have? What is our stand on the environment? What is our infrastructure like as leader of the educational system, uh, institutions in the world represented here on this panel, but most of our kids don't have access to that? Our, our college graduates are culling. Um, the most affluent country in the world cannot even doesn't even have a proper healthcare system. We have the best coming out with staggering debt. Um, I could go on and on, and I'm not a critic of the United States. I'm very proud of the fact that I'm American. But the fact is we are no longer, this notion of American exceptionalism doesn't simply hold up I anymore. I believe there's going to be a panel on that very yeah, topic. Yeah, and uh, I think that would be a great panel to watch. But the thing is, I think that we cannot handle the fact 
that we are no longer what we claim to be or used to be. The second thing is a lack of self-awareness and self-examination. We are a country that has been built upon genocide and years of slavery. And unlike other countries that have never actually done any self-examination of any kind. And I think this leads to a country which hasn't looked at itself in the mirror for a very, very long time. And this does lead to some of this, this, this toxic sort of cloud of misinformation, chaos, because I think we simply are not willing to deal with that, their traumas and their past. Germany with the Nuremberg trials, South Africa with the Truth and uh, Reconciliation Commission. The United States... Mr. Rudd, I, uh, I wanted to ask you, because you best represent on this panel this area, one of the things about the information environment uh, in Western democracies writ large was uh, a distinction between uh, the, the information provided by journalists and that uh, was considered public information, news, public affairs, uh, broadcasting or writing. Uh, but in prior eras, um, the source of understanding the world and understanding what we, what we think is true or truth seeking uh, wasn't reserved for just that area. So the arts played a role. Uh, as we saw in earlier panels, theater still plays an important role, though we have a tendency to treat that as a separate part of our life. And certainly, most of what we see in movies and, in, and uh, on television, even though it has a huge uh, potential impact on the way we think about the world, we, we dismiss it as pure entertainment. But could you talk a little bit about the role that non-news plays in helping us understand what is true about the world? I think the, I'm again speaking only for the United States, although I could, you know, I could venture into other countries, I don't want to. Um, I think the United States, this is my opinion, and I'm just coming off uh, three months of travel within the United States in very small towns, uh, sometimes, you know, towns that have only three or four hundred people living in there, on a storytelling uh, production trip. And I've met literally hundreds of people and interviewed hundreds of them around what's happening in the country and what's happening in the world. I think, and this is again pure conjecture, there is no science in any of it, because of which I'm here as an American citizen also, does simply does not hold up. The notion that America is a, is the American dream that teller. I think America is crying out for a new mythology. I think the old story around America, uh, we're the leader of the free world and all of this, we are crying out for a new mythology. I don't know what that mythology is, but I think that mythology has to be written in a very modern way with all the diversity, with all the madness, the complexity, the joy, the exhilaration, um, and the opportunity of being American. And I think we need a new generation of storytellers to write that. Um, I don't know if that's an answer to really interesting and, and dark time, I believe, uh, of the current day, present day United States. That's fine. But I do think that the country is crying out for a new story to be written about itself. And that can only happen in the, once we are... So, um, that's, that's, that's really useful. Um, the, the factors, one of the things I'd like to talk a little bit about is what we think are the causes of to talk, if, if they're right that things have not changed as dramatically as people think, the concern seems to have changed. And so what the concerns over entering a post-truth era, concerns about misinformation, and I, I emphasize concerns because I also like concern if it isn't the reality of something being different. Um, I, I'll, I'll start by saying to the extent that I think these changes by growing hyperpartisanship, which is a phenomenon uh, in the United States, in Europe, uh, has been a long-standing phenomenon. Changes are real. Um, I think they're driven in large part by the changing information environment and the structure of that environment. Uh, I also think they're driven in relation to the developing world, even though we don't treat it like it's the same phenomenon of, of hyper-partisanship. Um, so that's, I think, a driver of this. And then certain kinds of issues, uh, like the growth of populism, like concerns over uh, global immigration, driven by other kinds of factors, <coughs> I think they all play a role in what I think is a real change, but even if it's not a real change, what do you think are some of the causes of people's concern, growing concerns about this? Let me just start with either Stephen or, or Nick on that. Well, I, I just, 
you know, it's, it's pretty simple and goes back to what I'm, I said before. I, I, I mean, I'm sorry to be so concrete. We went from having the, the mass information medium be highly regulated to its being deregulated with predictable results to creating a much more powerful new medium that was in, totally deregulated and uh, economically destroyed the old truth-producing part of journalism. So, I mean, to me, these are economic, structural, and political explanations that really cover a lot of this without our having to resort to sort of general changes in, in our social ethos. Um, I'm somewhat more in favor of uh, hyper-partisanship than a lot of my colleagues. Consensus and agreement, you're going to get the kinds of elite consensus, maybe, that brought us uh, the much referred to this. Um, you know, be careful what you ask for, and if you ask for a world of, of neoliberal economic policies, etc. I grew up in the segregated Deep South. Everybody who was educated, everybody who was respectable, believed the order we lived in was the right order. We, we had consensus around that. The consensus was horribly wrong, but don't be so sure that if you get consensus uh, led by the sort of... Let me try to talk historically, but historically in a funny way about this, because uh, I don't think there's a coherent linear story to be told although I'm very, very impressed with the role of multiplicity and the role of technology. I don't think we're, we're living in a time. Better educated, more prominent members of society, that that consensus is going to be right. It's going to exclude a lot of people and a lot of concerns. Let me try to talk historically, but historically in a funny way about this, because uh, I don't think there's a coherent linear story to be told although I'm very, very impressed with the role of multiplicity and the role of technology. I don't think we're, we're living in a time, this is the Latin question, qui bono, in whose interest is it that this be said, that this be believed? And let's look at it from the point of view of, of or in, in many of its features. Now, one of the most powerful solvents of the authority and credibility of knowledge claim a number of institutions I mean, start with the press, and subject to correction from Nick and from, from you, the press has been partisan from the year dot. Uh, it may, I'd like to hear you say whether it's more, hyper-partisanship is it more of a feature of the press than it is, but it's been partisan from, from the year dot, and papers, of course, got closed down if they were insufficiently partisan in the wrong way. Uh, then let's move over to something that seems completely different, which is science. And the idea has got currency in our society that science has been captured by the interests. Now, I think that's a story which has got only a qualified truth. Whenever you want to date the origins of science, it was captured, it was given birth by the state. The state floats on seas of science. Science made the state, and the state made the conditions for more science. Science and the universities was once the plaything of the, of the churches, especially the Catholic churches and later the Pro Protestant churches. If there was a period, this golden age of autonomous, disinterested, truth-speaking science, independent of other institutional interests, it probably lasted in part from about the German universities of 1830 to just before the rise uh, of Hitler. And even then, what kind of disinterested institution excludes women, Jews, and uh, ethnic minorities? What ch began to change, I think, crucially, is the success of science, the success of the Baconian claim that science is the condition for power. Once that began to be believed, and spectacularly so, with the rise of the German chemical and armaments industry, but even more so with Hiroshima and the Man Manhattan Project, the game was changed. The game was decisively changed after 1945, so that it is inconceivable now that science not be done 
with of the significant support of the state and crucially of industry. There is more industrial science than federally funded science in the world. The great industrial research labs originally of Germany in the electrical and chemistry, dye stuff and pharmaceutical industry date from about the 1870s through the, through the 1910s. And now we recognize that innovation in all sorts of areas is this, uh, in whose interest did you say this? In whose interest did you say that this drug is effective? In whose interest do you say that climate change is caused by, by human beings? And there it's not necessarily industrial interest, quite the opposite. But the interests of people involved science, science is in-house. And therefore, if that is what is understood, I think correctly understood uh, about science, two things, there's a basis making a career in meteorology. And this was the basis of an important episode of skepticism about climate change in the University of East Anglia. So we've got a condition, and it's a paradoxical condition. The great success of science in being enfolded into the structure of our lives has provided purchase for the question, in whose interest is this said? So, so I'm cognizant of the, of the time that we have left. I've tried to inject a little bit of a, um, uh, the rele relevance of this discussion and some examples from other parts of the world. And I know the expertise here is uh, US centric, but um, uh, can, you, can any of you talk at all about how, whether you see any of these changes playing out? Because the changes, populism, part hyperpartisanship, changing information environment, they're taking place rapidly in the, in the developed world in different ways, sometimes more slowly, sometimes more quickly, even jumping over prior stages uh, in the developing world. Do you um, have anything uh, that you'd like to add about how these changes that we're talking about may or may not play out differently uh, in other parts of the, of the world? You know, I'm just going to point out something that's very pop culture and doesn't have to do with anything to do with science or, or um, academia, um, social media. And I think it goes back to what Nick was saying, you were saying, that I think media literacy, particularly around social media, is absolutely critical because we're in an environment where we can actually create these fabricated realities and fabricated characters that occupy virtu virtual worlds, but that millions of people have now begun to follow. And I'll give you one example, if you could please quickly play my slides. Um, that example I'm going to give you is of, uh, of Instagram, and you may, not, may have heard of these folks, but little Michaela, this is a, 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 a robot, a, a CGI-generated personality that now has 1.6 million Instagram followers, millions and millions of dollars in endorsement deals, um, is a Calvin Klein model. Um, and has a, 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 a record deal. And the next one um, is her, this is her with a, super, a real super, a flesh and blood supermodel, Bella Hadid, who has paid millions of dollars just to take that photo. And here we have a different psychographic of the same idea. This is somebody who's inspired by Ivanka Trump. Um, also a robot, has thousands of followers, is, is now having advertising deals. Uh, a male version of something like that and a virtual pop star. And these folks are occupying these imaginary landscapes that are possible in this day and age. I don't believe this could have been possible 25 years ago. I want to add just one other thing that, that we really should mention if we're having this panel. Um, you know, in my post the internet, David Kay called The Speech Police, which I highly recommend. And one of the big things he says in there is, hey, you know, what's happening in much of the teen years, I've been running a small publishing company at Columbia called Columbia Global Reports. And we have a book out now by the UN Special Rapporteur on the, the internet is the state is suppressing what can be said. Good old fashioned suppression of speech by an authoritarian state with China at the top of the list, but many other countries too. We shouldn't let this panel end without that part of this story being mentioned. I'm glad you mentioned it and I'm afraid the panel did just end. So thank you very much.
For Greeks living on remote islands or in isolated parts of the country, having access to the most basic of healthcare services can pose a logistical and financial challenge. To address the core problem, regeneration and progress turns it on its head. Instead of asking these patients to travel to hospital and doctors, RMP brings the hospital and doctors to them, providing essential healthcare services free of charge. The Mobile Medical Units program provides free medical services in a range of specialties to people living to hard to access places around Greece. No less remarkable than the free care provided is the fact that it is offered by doctors and health professionals who volunteer their weekends to make it possible. Regeneration and progress also draws a direct link between health and sports. The organization holds regular sports activities here at the SNFCC and does so too for children on remote islands through its Sports Paths program. RMP also runs the Sports Excellence program, providing personalized metrics and input on athletic training to young athletes, including those preparing to compete in the 2020 Summer Olympics in Tokyo.
Χαίρετε. Hello. 15 years after the day, we beat the French. Maybe this was the play after which everybody believed that it could, we could even win the trophy. So we are here to talk with Angelus Harasteas, Trajanos Dela, Stelios Giannakopoulos, Antonis Nikopolidis, Vasilis Ambrakos, Ioannis Tsapalidis, and Theodoros Sagorakis. We are going to discuss about how this team managed to do what they did. First question goes to Mr. Topalidis, who was working next to Otto Rehagel, the uh, wonderful players uh, with their own ego, but um, they worked for the team. John, I have to reiterate uh, what uh, Mr. Rehagel used to say for this national team, the national team of these years. And he keeps asking, how about this new team? He has seen a few things, but he said, Yanis, we were lucky. We were very lucky because we had a very good generation, the right batch of people. They, keep, they were there, and we coached them. We were very, very lucky to coach them. This is what Rehagel said. So when we went to, to Portugal, we were at the airport, and Rehagel was coming from Germany. There was a football guy, name no names, and he would say, you will go to Portugal, but you will suffer the way our national team suffered in 1994 in the U.S. So I said, you tell him. I'm not going to tell him this. He was waiting there. He said so. He transl I translated, and he said, John, he knows something that uh, we know something that he doesn't know. We will go to Portugal. We have a very good team. Of course, we didn't say that we were going to get the trophy, but we actually believe that we had a good team. And this is thanks uh, to our leading players, the very good players we had. Mr. Zavorakis. You were the leader of the team and you took the trophy in your hands. Everybody took to the streets here. There were no social media back then, so you couldn't really know what was happening back in Greece. Now, the same question. How? First of all, I would like to thank our hosts here at Stavros Nyarchos Foundation. Manage to deal with your egos. There were 23 people in the team, but only 11 could play. You said so yourself. We thought that the team is something more important than our egos. We were there to stay, and we had been working for many years, three or four years, as a team. Indeed, John is right, but I think that for a good recipe, you need a good cook as well. And we're very lucky to have Otto Rehagel and John Topalidis. I keep saying so, and everybody agrees that uh, you should have uh, a very good climate in the team, good relations, in order to increase your opportunities for a stable course and achieving your goals. So I think, well, what was uh, our secret to success back then? I think uh, that our relations, our friendly relations, were the most uh, powerful tool in our hands, especially in Portugal, but not only Portugal, even before and after Portugal. So personally, I believe that this is of paramount importance to, in order to achieve goals. 
Of course, uh, we were lagging behind um, as regards communication. Let me give you an example. When we were on the plane to fly back uh, after uh, becoming champions, we were very happy as happy as it gets, didn't really understand what was happening, and we didn't have enough time to understand how great this success was and what we managed to offer. And we thought that maybe this is an exaggeration, maybe there will be nobody waiting us in Athens, and we thought that there was going to be a crowd. Antonis Nikopolidis, and then I will give the floor to Vasilis Sabrakos. Let us not dwell on this wonderful feat. We want to put a message across, a message of perseverance and effort. And I think that you are the right person on the panel because you were in the shadows of, because you were working with Vansix. He was another very good goalkeeper. Then you became the basic goalkeeper in our national team and you cooperated with some other guys who were in your shadows. So how important is this to achieve teamwork, everybody, especially in your case, you had to wait in order to get your chance. Hello. I believe that we all agree, and we have said so in our interviews, that one of the basic reasons of our success was that our egos were not as important as the team. We have to explore, however, the ways and the conditions that helped us work for the team. You very well know, Michalis Kasapis and Elias Matsidis and uh, Demos Nikolaidis decided to leave the national team uh, because of what was happening uh, in football. That back then, before Mr. Rehagel, and uh, the things in football were not very calm, I would say. I remember that Michalis Kasapis and Elias Matsidis and uh, Demos Nikolaidis decided to leave the national team uh, because of what was happening uh, in football. There are problems now, but there have always been problems in football. So now, 15 years down the road, the foreigner coach, he was a very good coach, and I think that he made us believe in ourselves, with, in simple ways, that one of the basic reasons was uh, Mr. Rehagel, not just because he was that his decisions were unbiased. He didn't. First of all, we all knew that he was not involved in things happening in the Greek football, that the coach trusted us and we had the support of the coach. And at the critical moment when a critical decision was to be taken, let let anybody bother the players. We were working in a protected environment, so we were feeling sure and secure. We knew who we were. Um, he excluded Giorgatos uh, from the team because he was uh, supposed he was uh, the best football player in Greece. Then, and let me remind you that uh, one year later, one of his children, because he was communicating with him because of uh, the German language. So he excluded Kostas uh, Konstantinidis, though they were close friends. So he proved that he is unbiased, he has a very powerful character, he is very disciplined, and nobody uh, could uh, affect him. He could take his own decisions. And some other tiny things, maybe create a safe environment and we start trusting each other. Then a disciplined coach knows how to leave you some room to express your own personality. 
to Doris Dellas uh, was taking the initiative. But the initiatives always come from the plan and the strategy of the coach. Nobody can uh, take distance from uh, the plan. So the whole environment uh, was a protected one. We all agreed without saying too much. And uh, what John says is very important. It was the right era. There was a very good generation which was ready to accept all these, to take it to another level. To be successful, not to win the trophy, I would agree to it to another level. So indeed, it is, this, it is what this generation did. It was more than taking it to another. We were not there to become champions. We just wanted to be very good. And there was the right environment for us, a level, because for the last 15 years, we were a reference point of the Greek football or the European football, for that matter, because this is a European or a, a universal football miracle, I would say. Young uh, children learn about this, and uh, we have to take it further to be an inspiration for young uh, children, and we want uh, to show them the right way. This is how I see things. Anyway, I tried to explain our journey and the relations that we still have among us we would in football, professional football, or in their lives. So this is the foundation for its support. We have certain activities organized for children, always through football. Now, you said that I was patient. Maybe I was too patient. Anyway, thank you. Thank you, Antoni. Vasilis Samprakos, you have uh, written a book. I also want you to say whether the problems of the last years remind you of uh, the era before the arrival of Rehangel, the miracle. You have uh, spoken to all kids. Now, uh, I want to ask you whether you managed to explain of the national team. Antonis has just uh, described how in a period of two years, approximately, from summer 2001, being uh, among these guys here. Uh, Chris, uh, this, uh, what we live here is a deja vu, because in the last four years, I would say, the dinner uh, separated, uh, separated in tables uh, according to the club, the AEC table, Olympia. And then you can ask uh, the guys whatever you want. Good afternoon. First, it's a great honor for me. 2003, the national team has gone from a period where football players would have a meal or host table, park table, and then another table for football players playing in foreign teams. And in summer 2003, when the team was training in Leoforos field, there were fans of Panathinaikos waiting for the international players of Panathinaikos to to uh, attack them for having lost uh, the championship. And uh, these uh, guys here, Trianos Delas was the first one, uh, stood up uh, to attack uh, the fans and protect uh, their fellow players uh, uh, who were playing in Panathinaikos. This is a, a fact. It happened. And after my uh, investigation, I had drawn the conclusion that it was thanks to uh, Otto Rehangel, uh, uh, because, uh, uh, with, together with Ioannis Topalidis, because they set up the first uh, service that was fair and just. There were no interconnections and bribes uh, for football players uh, uh, to go into the team. Everything uh, was uh, based on meritocracy. And as a result, uh, players started feeling good among them and there was no suspicion anymore because uh, uh, the central attack player would not uh, uh, have second thoughts that uh, his fellow players uh, might uh, have some interconnections. They knew that Otto Rohangel was only uh, doing what he thought to be right and that was the foundation for building um, uh, that miracle. Am I right, Trajanos? 
players, and this is what uh, others were doing. I, I fully agree with everything you, you've said, and I, I totally agree with uh, the other guys. It's good afternoon. First of all, I just uh, tried to protect uh, my fellow players. Uh, it was not bullying. I just created a very nice climate uh, based on respect for each other. And I think this is a foundation that still exists. And uh, we are here 15 days, uh, 15 years later, and there is, uh, the climate is still the same. Respect for people, so uh, the whole spirit is the same. Uh, we are having nice time together, and uh, this has been also very uh, helpful in the results. So we've had good results, but even when the results were not good, and uh, uh, since uh, the 23 member team that you mentioned before, Christos, were 23 leaders. So that's why, uh, that's how we have achieved that balance that helped us uh, uh, take one step further. And that lasted until 2014 when uh, George finished, uh, finished with. Um, the national team and Costas as well. And this uh, respect and love for our team, because uh, the national team was our own team, uh, irrespective of the clubs we were playing for. So uh, we were discussing together. I remember Theodore, when I was in Italy playing there, he was calling me on the phone, asking me about training and how I was doing. Theodore was the one who was always coordinating us and making sure we have a good presentation in, in the uh, game. And this is still uh, going on. You were there uh, today. He, he said that we have uh, to be well because we have a game on the 4th of July. So you see that what existed back then is still here. And I think that this uh, will continue to exist because uh, we respect each other. Uh, regardless of the success, I think success uh, came on its own because uh, we were thirsty for distinction. And this is perhaps something that is missing today. Yes, but uh, to reach that point and uh, create uh, this uh, team spirit, uh, you have seen and you have uh, found out in the course of time some consistency between uh, the words of Rehangel. He was saying, I want uh, players who will become a team. Uh, so there was consistency between his words and his actions, what Antoni said before, he this mindset. Well, being a coach myself now, and uh, apart from coaching issues, what uh, I'm trying to decided uh, to remove uh, from the team those uh, who were dissolving or deciding elements uh, or had the old mentality before or after. And I think that football players can really uh, realize this, they can perceive and uh, apply in practice very, very clearly is exactly what you've said before, which is the magic word, being fair. Uh, without uh, thinking what this is something we all had inside we knew that this man was fair and he was doing what uh, he believed to be right the result will be judged at the end but i think uh, there is uh, no doubt about his fairness which is a message that is conveyed to the players it's very important uh, people should not feel that they suffer injustice this is something that never happened with Erhangel, and that was his great uh, arm i think uh, angelos haristeas has described to me the first minutes of a game uh, where uh, football players started reading the game themselves and uh, uh, checking one another whether and um, uh, fill in their gaps because uh, great companies make great teams, right? Well, to me, the national team was not just that uh, they were trying to help those who were not, who were weaker. They were trying to keep them in uh, the team. It was my family. I was also playing abroad uh, all those years. So when I was invited to play for the national team, I felt like going back home. Uh, I had great enthusiasm. And as you're saying, I will never forget uh, um, uh, an incident. It was a bad time for me, and I, I was training before a game, and uh, uh, George Katsouranis told me, uh, uh, Angelos, you are not feeling very well. Uh, you have to focus, you have to um, do better training. This is something we were always uh, doing, always with respect for one another, and this has helped the team be united very uh, close and uh, with close friendship. There were never misunderstandings, uh, either between those who were playing or the other.
wrong. We had 15 games before Euro, I remember, a whole series of games uh, that was very uh, strong for the national team. We all knew that our coach, uh, as the leader of the team, would deploy the team the way he thought to be right, and he was uh, aware of uh, the skills of uh, those uh, starting a game. Of course, the results um, uh, are always uh, what, if I'm not wrong, a couple of games before Euro uh, we had lost, but uh, uh, where we handled, the, the way we handled those uh, failures was also the secret and the key for the next success, the following success that uh, came in 2004. I mean, uh, we were, uh, uh, we had an airtight space in the locker room, we never brought things outside, and of course there was tension, as, as there is always tension in a family, but we were trying to... Uh, you have won medals, you have reached uh, the level of medals, uh, both uh, with uh, uh, those tensions and uh, work every problem out uh, between us, within the team. George, George, children, uh, teenagers, uh, young uh, team and uh, men. And uh, even though you had injuries, you, were, you uh, never missed any game of uh, the national team. Um, continuous participations even when uh, uh, you were abroad. So since uh, you were a young uh, kid and you have had this experience as you were growing up, how important it is for young people to realize that uh, it's not just a club or a contract a deal that you have and you have to put pressure on yourself, but uh, um, you have to integrate this in a process of being well and uh, making sure that others are well. And uh, as you grow up uh, and get more experienced, you have to show to younger people that you quit, up, uh, you quit everything else uh, to uh, join the national team, even if you are on the up for all these nine things uh, prepared this month for this month. Um, as you said, Chris, before, corner of the planet. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the hospitality. We thank Stavros Niachos for giving inspiration is the most important aspect. And in our team, one was inspiring the other. One uh, was getting inspiration from the other. It's very important uh, to join a, a football game where your fellow player can inspire uh, uh, confidence, which is what we are missing today. This did exist. Uh, among uh, the whole team and uh, the coach, and it was conveyed every moment, either during training or during the games. Moreover, as you said before, uh, I was um, fortunate uh, to be also in a young national team, so uh, my mindset had always been that uh, the national team is above anything else because it represents the whole country and that's, uh, that was my view no matter what uh, team I was playing for either in Greece or abroad whenever we had a game of the national team the last week I always wanted to make sure I, I was good to be able to play with the national team this is something we all had and that's why we had such a great success and furthermore 2004 uh, was not a uh, uh, firework because in 19... We were wondering when we would have uh, the, the the next the chance, and that the next the chance, the eight, five or six guys managed uh, to get the European Championship uh, with the teenagers uh, team, and uh, came six years later, where uh, the achievement was even greater, and that was vis-à-vis -vis the Spanish uh, against whom you had lost beat them and uh, we were qualified because uh, that uh, final game in 1998 uh, was a uh, trophy. We were first in our club but then uh, we came second when in our club we uh, unfair but we were well prepared. We had good teams even with young 
inspiration from the other, which was very important, because uh, there were different characters, different personalities, and uh, some uh, people. There was a, a good and, and a strong generation, as we said before, and there was also trust, um, as you said before, the four players uh, to trust, uh, fully trust their coach. And uh, he gained our trust, uh, as Antoni said before, with a few things he has done, and uh, he has shaken up, uh, if uh, you if you want, all the others. Uh, so we all knew that if we don't uh, do what is right, we may be thrown out of the team. Uh, some players were leaders in their teams, and that was what they would convey in the national team, plus the coach, whom we fully trusted, which is very worked very well, plus the fact that we had great players. Uh, very valuable players. It's good to say that uh, it's a good team, a good family, but if you don't have great players, you can never get a European Championship. Yes, that's absolutely right. Stelios, we shall close the first round uh, with you. Let me ask you. Of course, the whole journey has not been uh, paved with roses. There have been also uh, bad results. Uh, for example, before Euro, the match uh, with uh, the Netherlands, six goals in a half, and then uh, disqualified from Mundial, a very difficult club in 2006. A, a team or a social uh, hole, how, how, how can they handle such a difficult moment? How important is it uh, to stay united in uh, tough uh, times? Because when things are easy, of course, everybody is happy uh, and everybody is present. It is in tough times where you have to check reality. Um, I would like to thank, in turn, wholeheartedly uh, Stavros Niarchos Foundation uh, for this collaboration that uh, will last until the 4th of July to revive this uh, game with the Portuguese, and we expect to see you all there for the game. First of all, concerning the principles uh, um, expressed here by all my fellow players and uh, everything that we are trying to convey uh, to the younger generation to kids, because this is the future of our country. And uh, the more children, the more kids we can influence, not just in terms of football, but also in terms of messages, social messages that we are trying to convey through football, because football is a vehicle, as Antoni said before. So the more we can convey, the better the society can become in the future. Um, now, a victory or a defeat, Anyway, anything that uh, surrounds us is a matter of handling, management, administration. Even a victory needs to be handled uh, uh, properly. If you don't handle uh, a victory uh, properly, you may be complacent and uh, be defeated in the next game. And this is uh, when difficult times start. Uh, especially uh, uh, victory uh, management is more important than uh, defeat management because uh, when you uh, after a defeat everybody um, you know uh, is trying to find out what went wrong and we start analyzing what we did wrong so that we can get better for the next game. There are no secrets in football. Uh, everything that was mentioned before by, my, by the other guys uh, uh, cover me because uh, it was a, a team that was a model, an example on all different levels. And my message for people here is that many coaches, especially in the five and a half uh, years that I, I have played for the uh, league, um, they analyzed our games. Ferguson, uh, Rafa Benitez, those were the top names in those uh, times in the Premier League, and they were analyzing in their teams uh, both uh, the, uh, uh, our attack and our defense strategies and uh, our tactics and our approaches uh, during the games. Um, and I think that uh, this is a Premier League, which is the top uh, level of the planet. This uh, uh, is an evidence of our major achievement in 2004. Well, we are discussing how uh, I has uh, served we, and uh, we are discussing this uh, with uh, six football players who were uh, the main players. You, you, you may say, okay, if you are a key player, you can easily place your I under the we. But uh, in Portugal, that uh, happened with 23, uh, 23 guys uh, who were renowned and famous and successful football players who were very important for their clubs, and uh, they had not participated 
participated in the final phase of Euro. However, they participated with all their heart and soul. They were trying to encourage uh, work with their fellow players uh, during training. And this happened because the gentlemen being here at the tournament would be equally uh, allotted in 23 shares. So. That would be a different arrangement because uh, when you uh, today, along with uh, the other key players, uh, a few days before the tournament, uh, they decided that uh, any bonus uh, would result uh, from this. So this is another key of uh, success. We are revealing all uh, the secrets of success. It's a great honor to have the President of the Republic here honoring us with uh, his football players in the national team. You know, Theodore, that uh, the key players will take the bonus and uh, the replacements will just take a small share. So how did you make that uh, choice, that decision, before uh, seeing the success coming? How did you make that decision to break it into 23 equal uh, shares? So this is uh, another key of uh, success. We are revealing all uh, the secrets of success. It's a great honor to have the President of the Republic here honoring us with uh, his presence. I think our daily routine for us. We all believed that uh, the 23 guys uh, who were there but we have a, a good climate, positive climate, and uh, uh, team spirit in the locker rooms. Even uh, those decisions that seemed to be tough back then, we believed that they all had uh, an equal share of success for this huge journey that uh, we had traveled. So I think it's a good blessing, actually, um, if you see that your colleague is happy. And let me tell you something more about this uh, team, which was really great. We all saw that as a collaboration, partnership. This is missing in our country. We don't have very good collaborations. And this is why we cannot realize the great soul of Greeks when they can set targets. This was not, of course, our initial objective. We didn't go there with uh, this uh, target uh, to gain the trophy. But as time went by, we found out that we can go forward only by working together. We cannot do anything if we work individually. And this uh, would uh, fill in gaps and weaknesses, uh, my weaknesses or Angelus's weaknesses. Because, you know, in sports, you cannot always be on a top level every single day, because some days you may be feeling down. So, no. And, uh, of course, uh, some things were given by God. When God sees that a team is united and uh, has a certain objective, and uh, if uh, 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 you see that we give things to one another. Uh, I, I, I think uh, these are good, but there was great collaboration in that uh, team. It was the maximum possible collaboration we could have. And this is how we managed that to uh, look. The most uh, difficult part has been, and that was indeed uh, exhausting, I, that I, this is a great honor for a team. Yanis Topalidis, let me ask you, was Otto Rehagel a, a, a difficult person to work with? Because you were his head uh, to be next to him all the time. I could not miss anything. I will tell you a story that uh, has um, uh, told me a lot team like ours. That was a great fortune because when we were all together, it was very pleasant and joyful. It was a very pleasant event. And just imagine two through his stories. Uh, we were talking with Trajanos, uh, who is a coach, and I told him, I wish you have the fortune to have uh, his life, especially the Second World War. He has told me so much about his life that I, I, I thought I was there. It says, I, it's like I have experienced this two people only for six years. It was after 2008 that we also uh, had a trainer. We were all doing, uh, the two of us were, were doing everything, but it was very pleasant. That was, it was a a real pleasure when we were um, all together with a team. You know that in training you may do something wrong, wrong you may choose different tactics, uh, different strategies, but uh, these players were the guarantee that they would fight the game, either a friendly game or an official game, they, they would uh, fight. And that's why Rehangel told me once when we were playing on the island of Crete with Norway, I don't know if you remember, you remember 1-0, the, the conditions were horrible. And he told me, Yanis, you see, we can do something here. Uh, 
questions. So the first years were very tiring, very exhausting, because I had to be present always and everywhere. Uh, I would like to, was talking about some distinction, not uh, the cap. Uh, even a qualification for Euro was a great distinction for Greece, because it was a country with uh, not so many or about the role of Otto Rehangel in this uh, whole process of uh, setting up the team. And I would like to insist on something that Antoni said before. These uh, gentlemen here were all uh, people who wanted uh, to see the national team working with a different mentality, different mindset. They were ready for that. So uh, a coach with emotional intelligence could see, uh, could distinguish who wanted to change. And he set up a, a thought that uh, a German coach came to Greece uh, to impose iron discipline. But these guys here, Antonis and George and Trianos, they have told me nucleus of players who wanted uh, to make a change, and this is how it all worked. Uh, concerning the discipline of Otto Rehangel, because you know, Greek journalists back uh, to be always seen to do the right thing. Am I right, Anne? Uh, that uh, they were uh, uh, working responsibly themselves. They were trying to be on time. They were trying by punishment or uh, fines and penalties. Self-control is needed because uh, all guys in the team, uh, you would even punish yourselves, those who were late. Well, no, we didn't punish. But, uh, you know, imposing discipline is not something that can be done. Oh, uh, they had a coach uh, who was disciplined, but uh, that was not uh, a person who would uh, knock on your door to check it. Uh, their own personalities, but they, had de they were determined to succeed, uh, uh, to win. And they were talented. And uh, if you are inside, um, he would impose his discipline because we knew that if uh, he detects something he doesn't like, uh, it was more than sure that uh, this uh, person would be thrown out of the team. So you need a single move. You can uh, uh, organize a disciplined uh, collectivity, but it, it is mostly need to be there every single day and uh, uh, try to impose discipline and uh, set rules uh, and so on related to the personality of uh, these guys and the determination of these guys and, of course, their talent. And uh, speaking of personality, I think it is only very few uh, teams that uh, could say, as we have done after a couple of defeats and uh, after some statements by Mr. Gagazzi, who said, of course, that uh, he was doing that, he said afterwards that he was doing that just uh, to challenge uh, or provoke us. But then we said that we would never, uh, it had great leaders. So we were insulted, and even the president of the federation said that he would never be allowed in the locker rooms, and I think he only to come into our locker rooms. That was a difficult thing to do, but uh, that uh, team was uh, determined. And again when uh, we were uh, qualified and then he disappeared again and uh, he reappeared after the game with uh, the Czech Republic if I'm not wrong and then uh, for the final game so it's many many things uh, which are important but uh, the key uh, things uh, the key priorities uh, are the behavior of the coach vis-à-vis uh, -vis the players, the behavior of uh, uh, players among them and respect, because 23 sometimes, the 23rd one, but I was always, I would always see myself as important. And some leaders would view me as important, so would view all 23 players as important and key players, because all of us, and even myself, uh, I was one of the... So we could all say that we have reached this point all together. So if uh, if we are to gain one euro or a hundred euro, we would uh, we would uh, break it down into equal shares. So it has to do with uh, the guy's personality. Uh, yes, uh, uh, since uh, we have to close the panel in a while, uh, if the four of you were playing aboard, uh, George, Stelios, Trianos and Angelos, uh, 
by Angelos, you had a double with Werder. How important was it to have the mentality, the mindset of uh, the local rooms abroad and not of a Greek uh, team? How important was it for you to manage uh, to place yourself under the collective interest? Well, back then it was many players who were playing abroad, uh, as you rightly said. It was not difficult at all for me. It was very simple. I'm one of uh, uh, the guys uh, who would always place myself under the team. In the beginning, Otto, since the very first day in Finland, uh, when I first met him because I would speak the language and uh, he approached me, he said, you will not play in your natural position, I will uh, make you play in some other position. I want you to do some things you never do in your club, no promises, just fight and we will see the result i was not bothered at all because i and the others have a national conscience when we were playing for the national team we were becoming the people that struggle for their country and i mean this so nothing bothered me, and the only thing I wanted was to win for my country, to win for my friends, and to win for my coach. This is important. Trajanes, the same question. You had this man himself, irrespective of the team. Of course, it was helpful to leave the Greek environment mentality abroad and it was very difficult for you to leave Greece and then you have to come back and how about a young person that has to take care of deal with uh, other very important football players because we had very important and huge people playing there and uh, then we worked with them because actually we have to play with them or against them every Sunday so we were preparing before the games. Thodorus was playing a leading role. In order to show respect, you have to show self-respect. In order to accept discipline, you should have self-discipline first. So all 23 of us, and even those that didn't play in the tournament, uh, managed to strike a balance. We were 23 football players, very important players. All 23 were leaders in our clubs. Just imagine for somebody to be able to handle the situation where he is not a basic football player. But anyway, we have managed to strike a balance. And I think that this actually created the balance. Stratos, all the clubs had a slogan, and you proved in practice that you were 23 modern gods. Now, what was your first impression when you had these slogans that you were like uh, to leave a big uh, football club in Greece, uh, to go abroad, and you have to start from scratch? You have to prove you are worthy. And what happened when you first went abroad to play with Porto? Yes, indeed. It's very important to leave your own comfort. And those around the table and the others who are not members of the panel today did the same thing, whether they were playing in Greece or abroad. Now, as to this, our experience when we were driven back, it was kind of funny to hear these slogans, but indeed this slogan, that actually this motto that it's not I, it's we, but it's true, it's real, it's football. You were actually... Uh, the leader and you are a record man in participation. Uh, now, what would you give now? And you have to understand this, otherwise you cannot succeed, unfortunately. George, uh, final word in time and have a full season in front of you as a football player because I think that you are kind of crazy and you played in a legends and, and while you were traumatized and you suffered all these people we played with or against and we had very, very important players playing with us as co-players. First for us who played abroad, indeed, 
we found out the real nature of the Champions League finals. This is very important. And we said we can do it with our football club. With, uh, with, we kind of demystified them. Of course, um, with Panathinaikos, uh, we were one of the eight teams uh, in our national team, we said. So, playing abroad was a very useful experience. Those people we only watched on TV, raising the trophies with their clubs, actually now they were co-players or our opponents every Sunday, and this was additional help. Now as to your second question. It would be nice to play football again. Well, this cannot change. Things have changed. This will never happen. I'm 42, even when we get 62. But still, we play. Uh, I played football with Mr. Drakopoulos. He has a very good team in place, actually. And uh, we are waiting for the next uh, match, uh, 4th of July, against the Portuguese. It's great joy because without football, what can we do? We were born in football. This was the love of our lives, and this will never change. Some final words. I think that everybody would agree that we would give everything to be together again in the line-up, to hear the national anthem playing. I think that it was quite chilly in, in a very good sense. Thank you. Το πρόγραμμα των εκδηλώσεων που υλοποιούνται για τον εορτασμό των 15 χρόνων από την κατάκτηση του 2004, μέρος μάλιστα των οποίων βλέπουμε να λαμβάνει η χώρα και κατά τη διάρκεια του Summer Nostos Festival. Η Republic is asked to come to the podium. is also part of the Nostos Festival, is under the auspices of the President of the Hellenic Republic. So His Excellency... Please be seated. I'm not going to tire you anyway. This was not something on the schedule because indeed even the President of the Republic has to learn how to hear and listen and enjoy listening. I would like to thank, however, Moreover, I think that it is my duty to thank you on behalf of the Greek people for two things, the Archos Foundation and personally Mr. Drakopoulos for this initiative, because what happens here today is very, very important for what you have achieved back then, 15 years ago. Secondly, for the example you have set with this feat, because indeed this feat is here to stay and it will gradually become a legend. It will even become a myth. But it wouldn't be that important. Uh, but uh, what is here to stay and what has to stay is the example. The example you have set, not just in football, not just in sport. And uh, we have to do it now. Indeed, you had a real speaking. The example which is the example of what we Greeks have to do if we wanted to achieve great goals. 
how to set goals and how to achieve goals. Otto Reagel, you believed in your leader and thirdly, you worked together. I became we in order to succeed. So, this is an example for the rest of us. I'm concerned about what is happening now in the Greek national team, I have to say so. But anyway, as we go efforts, and those that came after you, if they want to do something similar, they have to keep thinking about it, okay, that your example is good for us because it makes us think. First, we Greeks, through history, and it's our national DNA to achieve great goals, we have to set and achieve goals. However, these goals have to be realistic. We shouldn't struggle with utopias. We have to set an adolescent. I was inspired by our national poet Dionysius Solomon. How can we do this? We have to be inspired. We need to be inspired. Great roles, great goals, visionary goals, goals that can be achieved, or at least there is a probability. We shouldn't be satisfied with what we have achieved so far or with what we think we was. Our objectives have to be set reasonably and with vision, not in a utopic fashion. Reasonably, we know where we are, we know what we want to do, but we also need a vision, a vision. Secondly, we have to believe in our goals, we have to believe in our power. But this is something we call to handle our egos and the personalities of the others. Because we have to know that great goals own. And we, it's something we have to do all together, everybody. This means that we know how to handle our egos and the personalities of the others. Because we have to know that great goals can be achieved by people who have powerful personalities. We have to be honest. Big go bad kind of dictatorship, the dictatorship of mediocrity. It makes us fight, expose itself on the others, but to inspire by example. And what is even more important is that all powerful persons call for big personalities. And this is how we could fight against the most be excellent ourselves. So I become we when a powerful personality learns personalities have to recognize that there are some other personalities better than them. So we should take jealousy out of our systems if we want to move on. We should recognize the merits of the others. This is the only way to change in this effort. Finally, leadership. There is leadership in our collective efforts. We should be inspired and we need to recognize that everybody has. Leaders have to inspire. They shouldn't impose anything on the others. You cannot destroy the personalities of the others. Leaders are there to inspire. And for leaders to inspire, they should be role models. It's very difficult to be a leader 
You are not just an administrator. You need to learn how to really be the example of what you want to inspire. This is why being a leader is very difficult. It's a difficult sport. You have to be a role model. Your life has to be a model. It's not easy, but we have to learn what we want to achieve in our lives. Those of us who want or think that they want these visions. This is why they are here today, and this is why I am here today. I would like to thank you not just from what you achieved for something to the others. And you know, these people didn't have everything when they started this huge effort, but they believed in their vision from your example and from what you are going to teach to the future generations and to all of us, in fact, because you know, grand examples are everywhere. Where. When there is a great goal to be achieved, there are great examples. Thank you very much, and I wish you the best in your lives. ...of sports and education programs and local hosting communities. And now we have the pleasure of welcoming Maria Valles from the Barca Foundation to tell us more. Maria? Yes. Good morning, everybody. Um, it's a Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. The SNF is collaborating with the Barca Foundation for the implementation. Pleasure to be in this uh, inspiring conference, and I wanted to congratulate as well the panel for their achievements, their values, and their commitment. So I'm sure you have heard about Barca. And uh, you have heard the expression that uh, Barca is more than a team. We base this expression uh, in different uh, things. One of them is the governance. The governance, I don't know if you know that uh, Barca belongs, it's still a community club, and it belongs to the 140,000 members that are, that are composing the club. Second one, um, Barca, uh, for Barca, is more than winning, is more important the way we win, yeah? the fair play, what uh, we have heard uh, before. And also, uh, Barca is more than, more than a club because it wants to have a social impact in uh, these values in one war, and there are five values. The war is heart, heart, like corazón. Uh, and that's why it has the foundation. DNA of Barca is based in values, and we summarize artists. The, this, the, the heart stands for humility, effort, I and mean, Barca are based in these values. And these are not only theoretical values, this is all, we put them in practice, and I will put respect and teamwork. This is our heart, and all different things that we do. Examples. One is La Masia. La Masia is our technical football training center. And here uh, we have a specific program that uh, we call uh, Masia 360 degrees. And our leitmotiv is we train human beings to become footballers we don't train footballers. And teamwork is at the core of uh, this idea. So this is one thing that we put in practice every day. More than 700 uh, children and young people are in La Masia right now. The second one is our foundation. Yeah? We have our own methodology that uh, is based in sports and is based in education of values. Uh, we, what we don't do is take, uh, we have a methodology, maybe you heard yesterday uh, about football net. This is a methodology, uh, this is done by the club. Yeah? We, we, this methodology uh, becomes a social educational uh, tool. And uh, through this methodology, what we foster are things like social integration, uh, we tackle prevention of violence or violence. 
So uh, we, we are now in 59 countries, uh, and uh, with FootballNet, with this methodology, for instance, we teach children and young people other skills than formal skills, like communication skills or social skills. We have been implementing this methodology in, uh, for instance, here in Greece, with refugees and migrants, or in Italy, or, or in Lebanon. And uh, we have conducted an evaluation impact. Yeah? So this methodology thinks that uh, after two years we have seen it, in the case of refugees, is that first, I'm telling you, it's also based in heart, in the different values. What we have seen through the impact evaluation the emotional well-being of the children that have been participating all over the two years has, has increased a lot, important. And the third thing is that uh, they have now the feeling that uh, they belong to a community. Second, the so capacity of socialization of these children and young people has also increase a lot, so they are able to make friends with uh, easy capacity, more easy capacity, which is very important. And the third thing is that uh, they have now the feeling that uh, they belong to a community. And this for these children and uh, young people that come from completely destructured context was very important. Uh, a good climate, you need good relations, yeah? And uh, the most important thing is that uh, you need to... And I want to link this with something that was said in the panel, that is, to achieve goals, you need a, a good climate, you need good relations, yeah? And uh, the most important thing is that uh, you need to, to build trust. Because at the end, when you are in a, in a team, in a society, you need the others. Yeah? And uh, I would say in the case of the refugee and uh, migrant children, uh, those achievements of goals, more than scoring goals, are to overcome the trauma they have passed through and also the capacity to look at the future with some hope. And this, uh, Values, teaching of values, has been proven to be a magnificent, magnificent tool for that. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Special Olympics has a beautifully simple message. SNF support for Special Olympics reflects a long commitment to that simple message. A new grant to Special Olympics Hellas will help expand the center, namely that the world where all are included and respected is a better world for everyone. Programming around Greece. Additionally, a major three-year grant from SNF supports Special Olympics International's efforts to promote unified play and learning through inclusive sports and education. That spirit of unified play is also part of the Summer Nostos Festival with sports activities designed for kids of all abilities uh, taking place each day of the festival. Other SNF grants, grants promoting inclusive sports, include sport for New York Roadrunners Youth Wheelchair Racing Program and for the Nautical Club of Thessaloniki for the procurement of specialized sailing vessels for people with disabilities. At the new Madison Square Boys and Girls Club in East Harlem, SNF support of the state-of-the-art turf soccer field gives to hundreds of kids an opportunity to engage with the beautiful game of soccer. Finally, a grant to the foundation of former FC Barcelona player Jose Edmilson helps to build new playing fields for underserved boys and girls in his native Brazil.
mean, we get a, a proposal, uh, Olympics, an amazing organization under the leadership of Tim Schreiber. We were very happy immediately to see the positive effect to assess. We always try to say, does it add value to society and are the people involved ethical, efficient and effective? In the case of the collaboration. The hope is to start see in countries, not only in, in Greece, but in, in other countries, to see inclusive schools, to see inclusive classes, to see inclusive sports happening. We're thrilled and grateful to the Stavros Niarchos Foundation for their pioneering belief in the gifts of people with intellectual disabilities. Their gifts, not just to be the recipients of our care and concern, but to be the teachers of a new and more inclusive world. Together, we'll create a unified generation. Nothing could be more important. Jogue junto, aprenda junto. Play unified, learn unified. Play unified, learn unified. Play unified, land unified. Thank you, Star Wars Niarchos Foundation.